And when that is lacking, there's no anointing. So only honor brings the anointing into a church. So when a church lacks the anointing, it's usually because there's a lack of honor there and people see the minister just, ah, uh, oh, he's just this guy, you know. In this session, part three of the interview, Prophet Leon Dupree shares a key principle for seeing the prophetic anointing flow in your life and church. He shares the importance of the fivefold, why we need prophets and three levels of the prophetic. So let's grow in the prophetic. Okay, Prophet uh, Leon. So yeah, so in previous session, we, we spoke about um, the power of God, and then we went into also the, the persecution side of things. It seems like where there's, when people move in power, there will be persecution as well. Yeah. And this is sort of yeah. part of the package. And uh, so in this session, uh, let's move into more talking about the fivefold and the apostolic, and then get into the prophetic, what a prophet, that kind of thing. No okay, problem. so, but the fivefold, so your take on it, the importance of the fivefold, how do you see the fivefold? Uh, obviously, for me, you know, I mean, the scripture says that he himself gave some to be apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, teachers for the uh, equipping of the saints to edify the body of Christ, you know, um, uh, to bring him to a perfect image, a full man, to bring the body to maturity. So I believe a church can never reach maturity if they don't embrace the fivefold and if they don't have the fivefold activating because you're going to be unbalanced. It's like an unbalanced, you know, fivefold, five grace. And, you know, you'll see the grace of God fully in operation when the fivefold is active in a church. Um, then obviously you've got governmental structures within the fivefold. And this is what a lot of ministers don't want to admit because the Bible makes it very clear. It says that, uh, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 12, Eight, that first he gave apostles, then prophets. Then it goes on, and I think it is a teach, third teachers, yep. medical workers. And he goes on and on, you know. So, but first apostles, then second prophets, third, as he basically says, first, second, third. So speaking of a hierarchical order there, very clearly. So you see that your apostolic and your prophetic gifts are the governmental, mainly the governmental. Now, some people would say also the teaching gift in because they mention apostles, prophets, and teachers the same vein. But we said just because we can we can cross-reference that with Ephesians. Uh, I, th I think it is a 2.20. I'm not exactly sure where it says that uh, the foundation of the church is the apostles and the prophets, you yes. know. Uh, I might just have the scripture reference wrong, but um, uh, and, uh, it's around there. So I cross-referenced it with that, um, that apostles of prophecy foundation is first of the church. So when a church lacks the apostolic and the prophetic, they lack a substance and a tenacity and an, a grace in the spirit that can take a church further, uh, that can advance. The Bible says, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. 2 Chronicles chapter number 20, two verse, 20 verse 20. And you shall be established. Believe in his prophets and you shall prosper. The word prosper is to advance, to go forward, to move beyond. So prophets cause you to get out of a stagnation and move beyond. Whenever you get an apostolic or a prophetic grace into a church, whether it's by invitation or so, they'll shift your church into another level, that gift. So you have many people that have a prophetic gift, but it's the gift only, it's not the office. But the office will shift your church and will move it to break open for growth to come in, in both the apostolic and the prophetic gift. So I believe the church needs both the apostolic prophetic side, and then you have the other gifts of pastor the teacher, the evangelist. And, um, but that fivefold makes the bride beautiful, gives grace to the bride, and then the bride will operate in grace. And we have now people in legalism, we have people in, 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 in critis, critic ministries and discerning ministries and because it's unbalanced. So when a church is, have that balanced gift, you can maybe have the prophet that's a bit too hectic, but then you have the pastor that's coming in and saying, let's have a balance here. Then the pastor can be too soft and you can have the apostle that says, no, listen, it must be like this. And you can have the evangelist that's one of one source, but the teacher can say, let's, we must also teach the body of Christ. So you have this, this diversity of gifts. And, you know, we said earlier, we spoke about diversity earlier in the previous session, but there's beauty and diversity, yeah. you know, so God doesn't want us all to be the same. Uh, the, every gift is different. Everyone is different and there's beauty in diversity, you know, um, uh, diversity doesn't mean lack of un unity, but um, it actually you can have powerful unity and diversity. The body is many different members, but working together. Yeah. So um, no machine can work together. It's all the same parts and our body can't work together. It's the same parts, but the fivefold 
is needed because it equips and it matures. So I can immediately when I go into a church, if the church is mature or not, and that is a direct reflection on the fivefold. Now, just to, you know, that's Ephesians 5, 4 verse 9, where it says, you know, and he gave himself to be, uh, to, to some, sorry, he gave him some to, some to be apostles, prophets. But if you go to Ephesians 4 verse 7, I want to read this to you, and I think this is very foundational for the fivefold. In Ephesians 4 verse 7, um, I can say it by memory, but just, you know, he says to each one of us, now, please remember this is in context with verse 9. So he's going to go, to, I mean, verse 11, where he says he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets. Yes. So it's in that context. He says, but to each one of us, grace was given. So he says, every one of us, grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. People don't understand that verse because you have Christ, he says, to every believer, grace is given. But that believer's grace is determined by a measure of Christ's gift that is also given to them. So who's Christ's gift? Christ's gift is the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teacher. So the measure of Christ's gift that you have in your midst, who is your apostle, who is your prophet, who is your evangelist, who is your that is in your church to the measure that they have experienced Christ and they are called is the measure that you can receive light and will you be covered. That's why you can walk into some churches and the, the person, the minister is not called with all due respect, might be a businessman, might be somebody that was just passionate, but there's not grace release and extended to actually protect and grow and mature that body. So that everybody in his church is limited as a rule to his growth. Yeah. You know, that's why I believe that the whole fivefold has to be in the church also. So you don't just have this one man syndrome and a, you know, it's just one man syndrome. The body can't be beautiful, complete, and it will always be lacking. And in fact, uh, you know, the Bible says uh, that now you should not be lacking, but, and with this, your doctrine will be correct and you'll not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and trickery by the trickery of men. All of this is in context with a fivefold. Yes. And we see now how many people are pulled by this little doctrine, then this teaching, then that thing. Then they listen to this YouTube preacher, then they believe this, then there's no tithing, then it is tithing. And because they, they are moved by the winds of doctrine because they don't have the fivefold. Yeah. We can say, but they don't know the word, they're not mature. But how does somebody get mature? Fivefold yeah. in the church. Yeah, no, I agree fully. So, I agree. So it's like for how I see it is like if for anyone who wants, to, if you want to, as, as we spoke earlier, the, the fivefold reveal Christ. And as you said, they reveal, release grace. So if you want to move your church for any pastor, any church leader, if you want to move your church forward, mm. embrace the fivefold. Definitely. Yeah. Get the fivefold coming through your church. Mm. You know, would you say, is that one of the keys? How do you, how do you grow in that fivefold? Do you need to get the, the fivefold well, you, to you, come you, and preach through yeah. your ministry, through your church? What do you say? Some practical I mean, ways of to, growing. You need, to, you need to have, obviously, I mean, you can have a fivefold in your church. You don't necessarily have to get somebody from the outside in. But if you don't have the fivefold in your church, get somebody from outside in. Yes. Obviously, make sure it's 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 a credible person and so on. But growth, I want to just break a golden cow, you know, of a lot of people. A lot of people think the prophetic makes a church grow or this makes a church grow. There's one thing that makes a church grow, leadership. It's, you know, because you can see mega churches in America. There's no prophetic, there's no apostolic, but yet the church is growing. It's le leadership. So there's certain, certain church growth tactics and principles. A church cannot grow beyond 200, never in attendance, unless the pastor has leadership ability and capability. If it stays 200 or younger, he's, he's still in the pastoral family side. It's a family church. But the moment he shifts into I'm a leader, yes, the vision, uh, this is what we're doing, yes, the structures of the church. Then you begin to put a team and you begin to put structures in and uh, you actually have the ability to impart into fivefold and raise them up. Now people can go beyond 200 the, the, and then it goes to touching 800. It'll never go beyond 800 unless you become militant. So there's those certain keys and then it can never go beyond 1,200 or so once you apply something else in. And... Um, so a church can never go beyond 800 if they not, don't become militant. And a lot of people would get offended when a church becomes militant, but it's because they got a small church mindset and you shift to becoming militant and your church begins to grow again. Mm -hmm. So a lot of churches battle to take that facet on, but obviously that's leadership, you know. Um, so if you say militant, do you mean just very much focus on the mission, like missional? Or what do you, what no, do you say? No, I, when I see militant, I see structure, I mm -hmm. see people coming in, nobody, nobody comes to my church and lay hands. No, no you know, uh, um, so there's order. you go through our order, you Divine go through order. our vision, our discipleship, you go mm -hmm. through our 
training, our approval. And once we feel you are safe, you will be allowed to, and the church will know that you can lay hands uh, because otherwise it's a free for all, it's a buffet. And then this comes with different spirits and this comes with that spirits. And, you know, and also this importation of a man's soul. So Paul said that I don't, didn't import you. I didn't give you only the gospel, Timothy. I gave you my own soul. I gave you my own life. So this importation of a man's soul towards somebody. So somebody comes from another church, they're bringing the soul, the DNA of another person, and it brings schism into the body of Christ or just the wrong doctrine or something like that. So that's what I mean by militant. Uh, if somebody says in the wrong chair, get out, sit by that chair, no offense. You know, uh, that people must learn to be militant and then you become salvation. Discipleship becomes militant. It's obviously family, but there's a mission driven that yeah. this is militant, but then the order also, you know, somebody can't just come and rebuke the pastor, rebuke a leader. If somebody, anybody uh, in our church rebukes one of the pastors, like out of line, they, they will be, you know, there's order. They're going to be answering for that because honor also goes with militants, mm -hmm. military. So your church can't go without honor. Honor is very important. Now we know people can take it to, to a stretch of too far, mm -hmm. but there must be a balance. You yes. know, there's a right way of honoring. And when that is lacking, there's no anointing. So only honor brings the anointing into a church. So when a church lacks the anointing, it's usually because there's a lack of honor there and people see the minister just, ah, uh, Oh, he's just this guy, you know. So they can't receive, the minister can't give out. There's a block of the flow. So that's what I mean by militant. And okay. I'm, you're militant with your staff, militant with the leaders, um, you know, uh, militant, yeah. Okay. No, Paul I, said, I you know, I salute you. Mm. Paul said, uh, you know, he used militant wording. We see mm. the boot camp. We see when he spoke of the demonic, he says principalities, powers, uh, rulers of darkness, um, uh, evil, wicked, evil spirits. And, um, if the devil can work in a boot camp militant way, how's the church gonna mm. be victorious, you know? Yeah, no, divine order is, is yes. critical. And what you touched on now is the whole concept of honor. It, 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 seems, it seems like Western Christianity, there's a lot of dishonor in the sense of we, we, we skeptical about leadership. We, uh, someone calls himself a, a prophet. Ooh, you know, and mm. people tend to dishonor and then they miss out on the reward. So in terms of honor, maybe just share a little bit. How do you feel? How, how can we build out a, a culture well, Jesus of said, honor? Jesus said, I could do, the Bible says, he could do no great miracle yeah. in his own hometown. Yeah. Cause they saw him as Joseph's little boy. They yeah. saw him like, Hey, who are you? And the Bible says he could do no great miracle except lay his hands on a few and only some were healed. That's what the scripture says, quote, yeah. unquote. Now imagine God in the flesh yeah. couldn't move in a miracle. The Bible says he could not. Yeah. It doesn't say he would not mm. or he doesn't want to. He literally was blocked. So there's one thing that can block the miracle power of God, even God himself. It's dishonored. Yes. You know, so when somebody doesn't want to receive, you can do and scream till you're blue in the face. You're not going to make that person receive yes. from you. You might as that's why Jesus gave us instruction. Dust the, dust, shake the dust off your feet, move on to the next yes. place because he knows you're not going to convince that person. Mm. You know, there's be another way to reach them. Mm. You're going to, you move on to where people you'll receive. So honor, what you don't honor, you can't receive what you honor. You can receive what you honor. You can enter into. Will you criticize? Will criti will 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 limit you? You know. So, a lot of people want to attack the anointing they actually desire to operate in. Okay. A lot of people, you know, have a desire to be in the prophetic, but they're attacking prophets. You know. So, honor God takes honor very seriously. So much so that David couldn't even cut the the piece of Jesus garment. Now, that's, now, that's very specific. You know, if you look at the scriptures, you see that happening. You see David t grabbing the garment there, Saul grabbing the garment of Samuel. You see the lady with the issue of blood grabbing the garment of Jesus. You see the devil, you see, you see, um, uh, Potiphar's wife grabbing the garment of Joseph. So you see it going right throughout scripture like that, how the Old Testament speaks of the new covenant and Jesus came and they grabbed his garment and, you know, and when he was crucified, they tore his garment and we can, and then, Getting to Paul, we see how Paul, they took off the garments that was on him and they spread it to the people and they were healed. So, uh, but anyway, um, I believe still in honoring yes. uh, because the anointing out of experience of 10 years of ministry, I mean, we, the church is, you know, we're a bit strange for the ministry because the church is seven years old, but we've been 10 years in ministry, I, I, our own itinerary ministry, but I've been serving ten, more 10 years than that. So in ministry, like experience, I'm 20 years, you know, mm -hmm. but I mean, I served the first 10 years, just serving another person. And then I had to learn to honor, I had to learn to respect and serve another man's vision before my vision could come to pass. Yeah. And even that person might be a soul against me, might be all those tests would come. It's not about how evil they are, it's about what God wants to do in my heart. And the Lord, I had a radical, I forgot to share with you this encounter. I had a, a life-changing encounter when before I, just before I was sent out into ministry, 
life-changing encounter. I was in a 40-day water fast. I didn't know I was going to be sent out or anything. I was in a 40-day water fast. And on this fast, about day 37, around there, I was taken into a trance, full-blown trance. And uh, I was just on water, full-blown trance. And I saw myself lying on an altar like Isaac with Abraham. And I saw myself on an altar and I felt like sticks and stuff like that. Into me. And as I was lying on the altar, I looked and I saw the face of my spiritual father over me. And I saw a knife in his hand getting ready to stab into me. And the Lord said to me, I don't remember what, it's so long since I told this testimony. Uh, so he, he showed me TV screens all over and he showed me my ministry, crusades, church planting, broadcasting, big ministry. And he said to me, are you willing to lay your life down, your vision, your dream down for the vision of your father? And, I, and he showed me my ministry, you know, and he said, are you willing to lay that down for the vision of your father? And I automatically answered, said no. You know, I was like, I couldn't, it wasn't me. I was, it was like, I was looking at myself from a third person. And I was like, oh, how could I answer that? You know, like that. And then the Lord asked me again, he repeated himself. Screens came up again. He said, are you willing to lay all of this down to serve the vision of your father? And I was given my own ability to answer out of myself now. And I said, yes, I would. Yeah, but it was very difficult. And I saw him with a knife over me like this, getting ready to stab it into me. And I came out of the vision. Sure. And, um, uh, uh, and that happened in real life, you know, uh, meaning that there was a time when my own spiritual father wanted to destroy my ministry. And, um, but I also had to come to a place of just wanting to serve him, serve his vision and not my own. And after I had that vision, it was about three months, four months after that we were sent out into, into full-time ministry. So um, I believe in honor, I've always believed in honor. Um, I don't think you could go wrong with honor, having the language of honor, Jesus had it all over him. If we look at the scripture all over them, I think when people become familiar, Familiarity is a threat, an enemy to the anointing. So they were familiar to Jesus and familiarity is the killer of the anointing. Yeah. But the moment somebody is familiar around you or with you, they will never receive from you, ever. You can cancel that. You can take a red mark and cancel that person out. Know that they will never receive from you. Yeah. So I address those things very hard in my church because I can feel sometimes familiarity coming. Because I'm a, you know, before you're a prophet, I mean, I, I was a, traveling prophet, uh, itinerant minister. So you come into a church once year, everybody's excited, everybody loves you more than the pastor and because you've flown the gift. The only reason they don't like their pastor so much or don't see anything is because of familiarity. Yeah. So the pastor thinks, oh, I don't have an anointing like that one. It's familiarity. Yeah. So people have become familiar to the gift too there and that's why it's not flowing. You know? Yeah, and as you're saying, so if there's honor, because it often happens when one travels, because there's more honor, hmm. you see more of God showing up. You yes. see more miracles, you see the yes. power of God moving and then, as you say, we attended your own church, more familiarity, and then people miss out on what yes, the, the, yes, the yes. preacher is carrying. And so I'm reminded of the scripture that says, we no longer look at one another according to the eyes of the flesh, flesh yes. but according Agree to the God one another according to the spirit. Spirit, you know, yes. and so for me, it speaks of to, to not look at, from, you know, not look at Leon as Leon, but to look at a man of God with an anointing, a gift from Jesus yes, on yes, his yes. life. And if I honor the gift, Ultimately, I'm honoring Jesus. Yes. You know, yes. I'm honoring Christ, Christ's grace on your life. And therefore, one can receive yes. um, the reward that comes with honoring the, 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 um, the fivefold minister. Absolutely. So, so, but, so before we get into the, the, the New Testament prophet, you know, something that the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart this, this last while is the human nature is that we tend to make idols of things, you know? So it's like we take the gift of God, and then we tend to make it God. You know, it's like, even like I say, sometimes we, we, God gives us worship. It gives us beautiful music and worship, but then we tend to worship, worship. We don't worship Jesus. Mm. You know, mm. if you get what I'm saying, or well, we, mm. God blesses with creation and people worship the sun mm. instead of worship, worshiping the creator. Mm. And, I, and in the kingdom of God in church life, I, it, we also sometimes see that, you know, that it, say you're a prophet of the Lord and there's grace and gifts and the Holy Spirit's working through your life. And then people tend to, so, so honor is healthy, mm. but then there's this unhealthy bit where people can start to idolize or mm. exalt somebody to be like, they're now God, you know, mm. they look to the person as God, mm. you know? So, um, so how do you, how do we, how can we help people to, well, I think it all, all comes down to doctrine. Mm. Doctrine is the doctrine you preach, you know, if people worship you, it's because that's the way you preach. There'll be the odd few cultures. You go to a certain culture and people will have the inbred into them of idol worship and so on. And mm -hmm. they can put you on a pedestal. That doesn't mean you are evil, you know, but yeah. if you don't correct it or if you don't 
begin to slowly correct it. I mean, if you have a church there, but if you're just in and out, it's, I mean, I had people on their knees weeping. We had people worshiping us and then but we'll stop them. You know, we'll stop them immediately. I had people on my knees. Sometimes I'll pick people up on knees, up from their knees. The one or well, a couple of times the Lord said to me, don't do it, leave them on their knees because that's their language of honor. Mm. And you know, so you can go to cultures where if you don't get on your knees, it's offensive. Yes. So it so doesn't, you need to understand the culture. doesn't worship. So you need to understand culture. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. I agree. And you could really offend, I could have offended them by picking them up, yes. but I know I'm not giving them so what I understand culture. So what I'll usually do, sometimes they stay on their knees and I'll put my hand, I'll pray for someone. And then, you know, that once they feel they've given that honor, then they stand up. And a lot of people get offended with it because they're just in their little bubble. We've never made anybody bow in front of us, never do those things. Doctrine, everything for me comes down to doctrine. You know, if I'm with my people in the church, I mean, we can have a bride day, we can have a social day, a family day. It's just normal. I walk amongst around, among, but it, it's difficult because now to get also the balance with still having honor and not getting it too familiar. Yep. That's the battle of ministry, you it know, because tough, you yeah. don't want to feel like you're imposing honor. You will never want to sound like that. You know, you want to force people, you know, force honor is not honor. Mm. Force honor is slavery. You yes. know, it's not, for, it's not, it's not real. So you never force on, I don't force honor, but I would preach messages, try to bring a balance to, if I feel it's just getting a little bit familiar and I just, throw things in or just, you know, but I never force on it. But if I feel it gets too much, then I throw something in the balance. Nice. Um, and it becomes a danger when the leader is a power onto themselves. And, you know, uh, um, absolute power destroys absolutely. So absolute power destroys absolutely. If you have too much power, too much influence, you don't have an answer, you're not accountable to somebody. Somebody that can just rebuke you sharply. I mean, they don't control your life, but they just, you fear them a little bit. You know, because how can I serve God unless I serve man? If I cannot, how can I serve God who I don't see unless I serve a man who I can see? How do I, the scripture also says, how do I honor God who I can't see if I don't honor man who I can see? So I believe men, we are representatives of God. So I need a person just to be able to say no, you know, or be able to yeah, address good. you on something. Yeah, we need, we and all I need think it. that would allow you to have the balance We've seen churches go off because they don't have a balance and yes. the person has a power onto themselves. Yeah. Absolute power corrupts. Um, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. You know, so, and then the doctrine goes off yeah. and there's nobody to correct them. The people under them can't correct them. That's dangerous. But I will never remove honor. I think honor, you know, That's huge. I honor men of God. I honor ministers mm. over me. And there's people that honor me. Um, the prophetic cannot operate without honor. Mm. Cannot. Very highly unlikely, but I, you know, I did. I know you asked something about the New Testament prophet. Yeah, so let's get, get into get the, that. Yeah, so New Testament prophet. How would you define it? How do how do you see the very good question? New Testament? I'm going to be very contradictive, contra <laughs> contradictory. I'm going to say some statements. Um, there's no difference between Old Testament and New Testament prophet, except for one thing. If you look in Scripture, in the Old Testament prophet, the prophet was the exclusive voice of God. He's no longer the exclusive voice of God in the New Testament. Only difference. So a lot of people try to water down the New Testament prophet by saying, oh, there's no more judgment and every prophecy is for edification, exhortation and comfort. A lot of nonsense. Give me the word. I want to see the word. If we can go to the word where it says for edification, exhortation and comfort, it's not on all the prophetic gifts because I can show you Agabus that came and prophesied judgment. I can show you, you know, so God, you have to understand the dimensions of prophecy. You have the spirit of prophecy, gift of prophecy, the office of a prophet. You actually have about seven, but just main three ones. Spirit of prophecy, gift of prophecy, office of a prophet. Spirit of a prophet is upon... Um, Everyone, when we have the Holy Spirit, we got the spirit of prophecy. Now the spirit of prophecy is also an atmosphere. There's a prophetic atmosphere, there's something a bit different, but in just layman's terms, the spirit of prophecy is the Holy Spirit, Ruach, the breath of God, you know, the inspired ecstatic state of prophecy, the Holy Spirit. The gift of which is, you know, just a scripture, for example, the spirit of prophecy is Revelation 19 verse 10, for the spirit of prophecy is the testimony um, of, of Jesus, you know, spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, that's right. Um, the second one is the gift of prophecy. The gift is when the Holy Spirit gives you the gift to prophesy. That can be for every, it can be to everyone that God chooses. It doesn't make them a prophet. So that means the gift where the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, you know, let two or three prophets prophesy and uh, do not, you know, desire prophecy, pursue the gifts. It's the gift of prophecy that comes by the Holy Spirit given, but it's not the office. Now those two realms, I just say, if people want to prophesy out the spirit of prophecy or the gift of prophecy, they must use the rule of the scripture uh, where it says, 
edification, exhortation, and comfort. So that realm of prophecy cannot go beyond edification, exhortation, comfort. The rules are that. So if I want to, if I'm a, the Holy Spirit is a gift of prophecy, I must make sure that my prophecy is guided by those boundaries. But the office is different. The office is a governmental gift of the body of Christ. We can see office gifts that never even prophesy. John the Baptist just had one little prophecy, the Messiah is coming. Uh, that's it. He was not, no gifts even operating in him. So office prophets are usually given a mission, a message, or a mandate. Some of them can be small, like Jonah that just wrote a few pages. Uh, some of them can be... Um, can be can have big books like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Um, then we go to the New Testament. So people say, but there's no judgment in the New Testament. But there, there is. The prophet Agabus came. He said a famine will be coming, and it was fulfilled in the next few verses. We saw them prophesying with Paul and putting the, the, the thing around him. We see prophets like Silas and uh, Judas. I think it was Silas and Judas. Mark and Silas, maybe Silas and Judas, Mark or Silas, but um, coming to Judas and Silas, coming to the uh, New Testament church prophesying. So we see many prophets. We even see pr uh, prophetesses in the, uh, some people argue whether it's a female or a male. It doesn't, you, you see the female version of a prophet. And, um, but a lot of people say the New Testament prophecy is a, a New Testament prophet is not as heavy as an Old Testament prophet. We don't see evidence of that in scripture. Uh, then people would say also that prophecy must always be confirmation. Have you if, probably heard about it? You know, it was always confirmed not a scripture for it. Almost every prophecy in scripture is, is a shock. It's the first time giving. So, you know, what, what confirmation? Um, so we usually say that this, those who operate in the spirit of prophecy, the gift of prophecy, the first two dimensions, you don't have to be a prophet to operate in that. They have to be guarded by confirmation. It'll be safe that if they give somebody a prophecy, there must be another witness. There must be, a, that's what the Bible says, two or three prophets prophesying that can test the word. Test it, yeah. But that's not for the office. That's for the gifts. It's in context with the gifts of the Holy Spirit that Paul speak in the Corinthian church about. The office of a prophet is something totally different. They come to give direction. They can prophesy your calling. They can prophesy gifts. They can prophesy governmental direction for the church, national, international prophecies. Uh, the spirit of prophecy and the gift of prophecy must not venture into national or international prophecies, not their grace. It's, um, they're going to get into trouble by doing it. So those are just, just simple basics that I just quickly. Yeah, so normal, so normal yeah. prophecy for the average believer would not necessarily go into prophesying future events and that kind of thing. And that's also what you say, so, yeah? So, so, so it's more for like the office of the prophet to get into future what's going to happen. No, the believer can also do future events. So this is what we call, um, this is what we call, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, forth telling mm. and foretelling. Yeah. It's a difference. You have forth telling of prophecy and you have foretelling of prophecy and you have forthcoming of prophecy. So forth telling is... I speak, I decree and declare. So I speak something and I trust that it's going to happen. Foretelling means I predict. It's a predictability. Forthcoming is a manifestation of that which you either foretell or foretold. So that's the science of prophecy, if I could say it like that. Um, you can, a believer can come to you and say, listen, the Lord has said to me in two years time, this is going to happen. Just predict if it happens, it can happen. But the Prophet, the office of a prophet carries more predictive ability, especially on a national, international level, and then callings and directions for people. So what people make a mistake, they will not listen to somebody only as a gift or the spirit of prophecy in relation for taking full direction over their lives. Now, first of all, we mustn't fo follow trust for direction from a prophet. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and directs us. But... Um, but a prophet can come and give direction if you haven't listened to the Holy Spirit, if you haven't listened to other signposts that God has given. But that would be somebody that's in the office of a prophet. Mm -hmm. They would know how to give direction. I've seen people that listen to other people prophesy that person is not a prophet. They obey them and they lose everything. You know, so uh, that is very important. That's just basic principles. So if a prophet prophesies, say something over one's life, obviously they still need to go taste it and... Yeah, if that, it depends on the level of that prophet. Mm -hmm. So you need to know where's that prophet in the body of Christ? What is the measure of the words that have come to pass? And, um, it's a track record, a good track solid record, track, very good track trace. Uh, what's, can you be traced? What's the track record? Who have you come out of? What's the fruits that you have? You know, are you just somebody we've never heard of? You're just popping up here. You know, that can also happen. It's, it's scriptural. You know, Elijah appeared and disappeared. So, uh, it, it, it's, it's scriptural, but, Test prophecy, I would say for the safety of the church, the Bible says two or three prophets, because you don't get so many offers of prophets. So that scripture was speaking to those, or, you know, the gift of prophecy must be nurtured in the church. But then the office would come 
past the church or be stationed in a church and would train those more and more in those things mm. and put the principles in place. Yeah, and, and, and they can also prophesy direction, big governmental things over the church, national prophecies and so on. Um, but the normal prophecy level is for edify one another, edification, yeah. exhortation, comfort. It must never be like, you're going to die tomorrow. No. Nah. None of that if you're not in the office. Yes, and so. it's also good because it's a safe, safe space. People need to grow oh, yeah, into the yeah. into prof into the prophetic. And if and you have a prophet, you've got a pastor. You can take your word to them, and you know you, it's a safe space. You'll be able to share the prophecy. You can be guarded and protected. I mean, those are simple elements of yeah. church prophecy. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay, awesome. So in the in the next session, we're gonna let's we'll we'll look at the revelatory process. How do you hear um, yes. from the Lord? And and we're gonna we're gonna unlock and unpack that a bit. No problem. Awesome. Thanks. So good. May the Lord give you this ability that we that Prophet Leon spoke of to have eyes and a heart of honor, to see what others carry so that you can receive more of Christ and his anointing in your life and church. Let's get dishonor and unhealthy criticism out of our lives. So we desperately need the prophetic anointing. In the next session, Prophet Leon shares profound revelations that God showed him predicting future events and how you can activate the prophetic in your life. So click on the end screen icon for session four.